This demonstration of spraying a typical polyurethane foam shows the high degree of reactivity of two liquid components being mixed and drying to the touch in 15 seconds. This high degree of reactivity preventing premixing and spraying with ordinary single component spray equipment was the basis for specialized two component equipment and technology pioneered and developed by Gusmer Corporation to deal specifically with the unique problems inherent in these highly reactive systems. The equipment's ability to efficiently handle modern polyurethane spray systems has been tested and proven beyond any doubt. But just as specialized equipment is required, specialized knowledge, training, and experience in the use of the equipment are also required because of the overall mechanical and chemical complexities involved in the urethane foam production process. This training film series has been designed as chapters in a book to cover the fundamentals which must be understood and applied in their proper order to successfully operate the equipment. As in all trades, the foam mechanic must have an adequate technical background to understand the principles involved in the operation of the equipment and to develop a working knowledge of the chemicals he will be processing. Beyond knowing the fundamentals, there is no substitute for experience. Chapter one will introduce basic terminology and concepts which the foam mechanic should become familiar with and will not normally have to be reviewed when the material it covers is understood. Chapter 2 will describe in detail the basic inner workings of the equipment and Chapter 3, liquid component properties and why they must be protected from unfavorable and extreme environmental conditions. Chapters 2 and 3 should be viewed and reviewed until fully understood by the foam mechanic who is essential for the successful operation of the equipment. Subsequent film chapters will cover individual models of equipment describing routine operating, service, and troubleshooting procedures. Each chapter corresponding to a particular piece of your equipment. Now let's look at how urethane foam is produced in the spray process and some of the properties which characterize a quality product. The reactive material sprayed from the gun is a completely mixed combination of two liquids which must be continuously supplied to the gun at an exact ratio. The term ratio describes the relative volumes of polymeric isocyanate and polyol-based resin, usually referred to simply as A and B components, which must be mixed together in order to obtain the specific foam properties the chemical system is formulated to produce. In slow motion, notice that the mixed materials immediately begin chemical reaction. The products of this reaction are polyurethane plastic and heat, or exotherm, which causes a low boiling liquid blowing agent dissolved in the resin to vaporize and expand. The expanding gas becomes trapped in the polyurethane plastic, causing the liquid to foam up and rise to about 30 times its original thickness. The time required between spray and full rise is then defined as the rise time of the foam system. After the complete rise has taken place, the polyurethane plastic, still in its liquid state, forms a solid skin at the outer surface, which becomes dry or tack-free to the touch. The time required for the tack-free skin to form is then called the tack-free time of the foam system. Rise time and tack-free time are usually specified at room temperature application. Many systems are supplied with faster rise and tack-free times for low temperature applications and slower rise and tack-free times for high application temperatures. A quality foam product will be composed of many uniform small cells which, because of their closed cell structure, will retain the blowing agent gas that gives urethane foam its superior insulating qualities. Poorly mixed, off-ratio foam has a noticeably different cell structure. The non-uniform, large open cells give this foam less rigidity and strength, allow absorption of moisture, and result in reduced insulating qualities, thereby creating an all-round inferior foam product. Foam density, which describes how much a cubic foot of foam would weigh, is a method used to describe different types of foam systems. To 
two pounds per cubic foot foam, or simply two pound density foam, has been the most widely used foam to date, primarily as an insulating material. Half pound density foam is ideal for use as a packaging material because of its lightweight and flexible strength characteristics. Higher density foams, such as five pound density, are used where greater strength requirements must be met. The most common measure of strength of a foam is compressive strength, where the maximum pressure the foam will withstand before deformation of its cellular structure takes place. 25 PSI, the pressure developed by 25 pounds exerted over a one square inch surface of the foam, is an average compressive strength value for two pound density foam. Exerting greater pressure causes the foam to deform. Five pound density foam has much greater compressive strength. 100 pounds on one square inch of the foam surface develops 100 pounds per square inch, which is within the strength limits of most five pound foam systems. Besides knowing some of the distinguishing properties of a quality foam, it's helpful to know something about the type of surface or substrate it can be sprayed on. By rule of thumb, any paintable surface is satisfactory. Surfaces containing moisture, oil, scale, or loose dirt would seriously affect bonding of the foam. Because urethane foam is a three-dimensional material, not just a thin film coating such as paint, the term board foot, a piece 12 inches by 12 inches, one inch thick, is used to describe a quantity of finished foam. A 3,000 square foot surface area covered with one inch of foam would have 3,000 board feet of foam. If it were covered with two inches, it would have 6,000 board feet of foam. The number of board feet of foam can then be related to the number of pounds of material used using the average figure of three and one half board feet of foam per pound of material, not six board feet per pound as might be calculated from theoretical density figures which do not take into account extra material consumed in the formation of high density skins on upper and lower surfaces of each layer of foam, material lost in overspray to the wind, and the applicator's ability to precisely control the thickness of applied foam. Another important variable in determining the amount of insulation produced per pound of material consumed is the substrate upon which foam is to be sprayed. Heat sumps, substrates such as concrete or heavy gauge metal, absorb large quantities of heat and are not quickly worn by the applied foam. Instead, the exothermic heat of reaction is drawn away from the mixed materials by the heat sump, causing a less efficient rise of the foam than on a non-heat sump substrate. At temperatures below 78 degrees Fahrenheit, that is, below the boiling point of the blowing agent, enough heat is lost to a heat sump that the blowing agent reverts or changes from a gas back to its liquid state. This is called reversion and results in a very inefficient rise of the foam. At temperatures near the boiling point of the blowing agent, enough heat is retained in the mixed materials to boil part or all of the blowing agent, resulting in a more efficient rise. At temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, almost all of the exothermic heat of reaction is retained within the foam, which undergoes normal reaction, giving the most efficient rise of the three examples. Where a heat sump substrate cannot be brought up to adequate temperature for efficient foam application, reversion can be overcome through the use of special cold weather foam formulations and spray techniques involving use of lower boiling blowing agents. Exterior foam applications will require a top coating for protection from the ultraviolet rays of the sun, which cause degradation of exposed foam surfaces at the rate of about 1 8 inch per year. After only a few days exposure, a visible discoloration of the exposed foam surface will occur as degradation begins to take place. Exterior foam applications should therefore be coated with a suitable ultraviolet barrier as soon as possible after the foam is in place. Depending on the type of interior wall or ceiling application and type of foam used, 
interior applications will present varying degrees of flammability hazard and should therefore be protected from ignition by a suitable thermal barrier which will provide a finished fire rating in accordance with local building codes or good safety practices as soon as possible after application of the foam. The foam mechanic's single most important piece of equipment is the spray gun, which he uses to actually manufacture the foam directly from the liquid raw materials. As stated earlier, it is a two-component spray gun, the two liquid components being separately supplied to the gun where material flow, mix, and spray can be started and stopped by actuation of the trigger. This visible model mixing chamber shows that the two materials, here represented by red and green, are kept separate by a movable valving rod, which upon actuation of the trigger, withdraws from the mixing chamber and uncovers the material inlets, allowing the two liquids to simultaneously rush in. The injection force of the liquids as they enter the mixing chamber from opposite but slightly offset injection slots causes a combination of impingement and rotary motion of the liquids within the mixing chamber. This motion simultaneously mixes the two liquids and creates airless atomization of the mixture into a spray pattern. To shut the gun off, the rod is merely pushed forward to its original position, simultaneously valving the incoming flow of both materials as the rod slides past the injection slots and displaces or pushes out the remainder of mixed material, leaving the mixing chamber free of mixed material and ready for the next spray cycle. The two most important requirements of the gun for manufacturing a quality foam product are continuous flow of both materials up to and through the mixing chamber and accurate ratio control of the two liquids as they are supplied to the gun. Of nearly equal importance to the spray gun, therefore, is the proportioning unit, which controls ratio and maintains continuous flow of both liquid components to the gun through the use of double-acting, positive displacement, piston-type pumps. The name double acting means that pumping action is achieved on both the upstroke and the downstroke so that only one pump is required for continuous flow of each liquid. Positive displacement refers to each pump's ability to pump forward a predetermined fixed volume of fluid on each stroke. The coordinated action of two positive displacement pumps by a common drive system establishes accurate proportioning of the materials at the fixed volume ratio required by the chemical formulation. Since these are very specialized, reactive materials, certain precautions must be taken in every phase of material storage, handling, and use. Materials should be purchased with the understanding that no solids will be present when you first open the drum. Since both materials are usually shipped in identical containers that can be very easily connected to the proportioner in reverse, unless your drums are clearly marked by the supplier, such as using different colored drums, a bright red circle painted around the bung of the polymeric isocyanate drum at the time the drums reach your facility should eliminate the excuse for any human error. The most important aspect of material storage is temperature control. Since the physical properties of resin and isocyanate are greatly changed with a change in temperature, a concept called temperature sensitivity, Material storage temperatures should be kept within the range of 50 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Below this temperature, isocyanate can undergo a process similar to freezing called seeding in which solids develop which will dissolve only by heating and agitation at a temperature of 90 degrees Fahrenheit or above. And if a rush shipment is left overnight on the loading dock or in a cold unheated truck, it could take many hours for the 500 pound contents of each 55 gallon drum to warm up to usable temperature, regardless of surrounding temperatures. Storage of material above 75 degrees Fahrenheit will cause gassing of blowing agent from the resin component, especially if the drum is agitated just prior to being opened. Loss of an excessive amount of blowing agent can have adverse effects on the resin component and the foam produced from it. Temperature control is also important when the materials are in use, where they must be pumped or pressure fed to the proportioning pumps to assure that both pumps are completely filled on each pumping cycle. Temperature limits for spray operations producing less than 20 pounds of foam per minute are 50 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. 
and for high output operations using more than 20 pounds of foam per minute, the lower material temperature limit must be raised from 50 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit to ensure that materials can be pumped in sufficient volume to supply the proportioner. If material temperature falls below these limits, the liquid tends to thicken or body up, preventing transfer pumps from maintaining an adequate supply of materials to the proportioning pumps. Momentary, irregular pulses of off-ratio material would then be seen at the gun, indicating insufficient material supply for quality foam production and the possibility of even more serious problems which would arise if spraying were continued. If the temperature of the materials goes above 90 degrees Fahrenheit while in use, blowing agent, gassing from the resin, will cause a high pressure condition within the drum, possibly exceeding the drum manufacturer's recommended safety limit unless special high pressure rated vessels are being used. To reduce gassing and possible loss of blowing agent from the resin material supply, and to prevent drawing a vacuum within the drum as material is withdrawn, a pressurized blanket or head of dry nitrogen gas should be maintained on the resin supply using the nitrogen harness. And since isocyanate becomes contaminated by extremely small amounts of water, even the moisture in the air, to form a hard skin like that on the surface of an open container, the dry nitrogen blanket should also be kept on the isocyanate supply at all times to prevent moisture contamination. Provisions must also be taken to prevent isocyanate pump shafts from becoming coated with solid material due to small amounts of liquid isocyanate leakage through transfer pump and proportioning pump packing areas, which would eventually react with moisture in the air and harden. Limiting weepage by keeping packing adjustment nuts snug is the first step, and diluting what weepage there is with a liquid pump lubricant supplied especially for this purpose further helps to prevent solid buildup. The condition of the pump lubricant should regularly be checked for discoloration or development of a gel on the side of the lube container, which would indicate that it should be replaced with a fresh supply. Understanding the information and following the good housekeeping tips presented here and in following chapters will go a long way in making the task of successfully combining and dispensing two such highly reactive liquids just a little bit easier.